Noticing what's present in your body. You don't need to change your posture in any way. You're welcome to if that's what you're feeling inspired to do. But just noticing what's here from the round of check-ins, right? What you shared, what you heard, what you touched into as you came inward. As Seven A Selassie reminds us, we're moderns. Like, even if we're total and complete Luddites and you're rocking that flip phone or you're just like no cell phone, no Wi-Fi, like you're managing to not get caught in this technological age, we're still moderns. And part of that energy of the moderns is go, 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 do, do, do. Like all this productivity, productivity, productivity. And maybe in other countries or in other cultures in this country, there's space where there's not this never ending, maybe never ending waves of pressure toward productivity and accomplishment. I love to blame it on capitalism, but I don't know, I haven't lived in a, in a socialist society. And I guess you can have a little bit of both of those together too in places. But I know for me, I'm always just, I just go back to the industrial revolution. Like that industrial revolution, they said, blah, 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 and you're gonna have to work less and accomplish this as much. And that's not what has happened. Wave after wave after wave, it's like, okay, now you can do more. Now you can do more. Now you can do more. And there's lots and lots of, I think, um, unfortunate ramifications of that. But just in this space, that compulsion to do, 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 go, go, go. And you all just stopped. You made a choice to come and be here online or in person to stop and be, be with yourself, be in community, touch that stuff. Touch the discomfort, touch the comfort. Hmm. And like to get off Philly on you, like, and that's some deep shit. Like the stopping, that's a radical act. And Buddha was a radical. He was going against the stream, like, and that's what you're doing. And it's, it's no small accomplishment. And if that's all that you do, and the mind is busy the whole time, thinking about yesterday and tomorrow and judging this moment, so be it. You stopped and you showed up and you're here. And for today, that can be enough. That can be enough. Just sitting down, you know, getting your tush on the cush, as Howie Cohn says, like, whether you're standing or walking or you're sitting on a chair, or you're on a cushion on the floor or you're lying down, it doesn't matter what the posture is. That's stopping. That's enough. You don't have to do more. You don't have to be better. You don't have to accomplish something. You don't have to find samadhi. Like, that's not what this is about. Samadhi is a Pali word that is often translated as concentration. It can also be thought of as collectedness or settledness. And sometimes people will offer a translation of tranquility, although sometimes some other Pali words are offered as tranquility, so it can get confusing. But this idea of concentration, I think, is a bit of a misnomer. Because it, at least in the culture that I've come up in, this idea of concentration suggests a doing. <laughs> and as long as there's a doing involved, I think we're missing the mark. So you, we'll, we can play with that more. But So often when we sit down to meditate, and I really appreciate the acronyms from one of my teachers, Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams, that SIT is an acronym of stillness, intention training or settling into time it's not about sitting so finding whatever posture and i mean that for you here too like don't be fooled by the all the chairs and the cushions as i as i try to remember to say there's a hallway there for walking there's lots of blankets over there there's plenty of floor space you can lie down like find your posture find your posture so when we sit the mind does this, all the things that the mind does 
There's all this conditioning. Like that's what's here. That's what's here. You've got a diagnosis or you've got some pain or some new crazy thing has happened at home or there's not such new crazy shit happening at home. Like, yeah. And you're here and all that is here with you, it turns out. And that's not a problem. That's not wrong. The mind will keep thinking. I, I might offer this a thousand more times. I know I've said it already here, but the mind secretes thoughts the way the mouth secretes saliva. It's not a problem. How we relate to them, that's where we have the opportunity for practice to recognize, oh, that's unpleasant, or oh, that's pleasant, and to be present to it, to be present to it. And I'm always exploring the language, not just for the check-in, but it showed up in the check-in today as well, but it happens in life, to help us recognize, go, oh, this experience that I'm having right now, or that I had that I'm practicing with, it's unpleasant. But can we stop with that? Can we not add on to that that it's bad or that it's negative or that it's wrong? Right? That's what society wants to tell us. Maybe the mind is still caught there, but it's just unpleasant, right? The dog bit my hand. It's unpleasant, right? I got a diagnosis. I'm scared. Fear is often, not always, an unpleasant experience in the body right? We, we're concerned about some future thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, I can feel my body. Maybe you saw that little Korea, like I can feel my body tense up and I can feel the heat. <sighs> okay, hi. I got you. <laughs> you know, like we can turn toward it. And pleasant too, like pleasant's pleasant. Great. We can notice it. But what if we weren't so attached to the idea that pleasant was good? What if it wasn't positive? What if it was just pleasant? Oh, it's like this. Oh, can I be with it? Can I feel it? Can I tune into it? Can I be here with myself with whatever is here? Can I appreciate the absence of suffering? Right? Just, just oh, yeah. Well, there's freedom from suffering right now. And if you check in with your body, perhaps noticing that when we go from pleasant, to positive or pleasant to good. I don't know if you're like me at all anyway. There's this immediate forward leaning, grasping. I want it to last forever because it feels so good. And that, 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 <laughs> this, <laughs> that doesn't feel good, it turns out. That's craving, that's clinging, that's really not very pleasant, it turns out. So if we, Feel that if we can notice, you know, slow down enough that we notice, oh, I was having a pleasant experience and I got so excited about it that I'm over here and this, and, oh, that's not so pleasant. That can help us to rest into the pleasant experience. Like, oh yeah, this is pleasant. Cool. Can I just be here with this? And I found that as I cultivate that ability, then I can be with the unpleasant more easily. For me, just trying to be with the unpleasant without cultivating this ability to be with the pleasant is much more difficult. But as I cultivate the ability to be, to just rest into this pleasant experience, then when shit hits the fan, or I'm having an emotional response to something, oh, hi. Oh, I can be with this. And I don't have to fall into my compulsive behavior. Like my personal compulsive behavior is I want to control your apps. I'm going to control you. I'm going to control this environment. I'm going to control me. I'm going to try to control my hip or my knee or my back or my digestion. Like I, I can't. And that like, it's again, it's that same thing, right? It's the grasping and the gripping. A different form of clean It's called aversion or pushing away. It doesn't work. And it makes me feel worse. It makes me feel worse. This idea that this moment should be other than it is. It's like, oh, it's just unpleasant. How does unpleasant feel in my body? And you might be able to check in with yourself right now around that. Like, how does unpleasant feel in my body? And you don't need to give it words, but sometimes internally when we give something words, we 
have a um, more intimate relationship to it and more direct contact with it. And sometimes the words get in the way, but it depends where you are on the journey in any moment. But for me, as I feel into unpleasant, there's a, a bracing, almost always a bracing in my body, a tightening of my heart. I often feel my thighs, my quads just go like they're seizing up, which is, of course, aggravates my hip and my knee, my back. And as I tune into it, as I befriend it, as Thich Nhat Hanh would say, hello there, my dear. And you just fill in the blank. Fear, anger, worry, pain, grief, sorrow, lamentation, despair, like whatever the dukkha is. Hi there. Got you. And we cultivate our ability to be here for ourselves. We cultivate our ability to befriend our direct experience. And that's kind of magical. We can just be here with ourselves, whatever, whatever the weather, you know, whatever is going on, we can be here with it. It's a game changer. And in that journey, in that investigation, impermanence, impermanence, impermanence is our friend. So often we get caught in this idea that we want something to stay, right? If it's a pleasant experience, we want it to stay. Good luck. Everything's impermanent. All conditioned experience is impermanent. And when we remember that, when we're having something that's not so cool going on, we feel some freedom. It's like, oh, it's temporary. It's temporary. I was feeling quite hot a little while ago. I don't feel quite hot anymore. It passed. It passed. Not because I did anything, right? I had already taken off. Well, I guess I did take off my jacket, but I was still hot for a little while. Right? So we practice to be with it. And then once we're able to be with it, discernment can arise of a wise action, like taking off my jacket or putting my hair up. Like, Oh, discernment is there. But when we're caught in it, there's no space for the wisdom to emerge. We're too much in the, in the fight with it. So if we can remember impermanence, we can know, oh, this is temporary. In the current vernacular, it's a season, right? It's just what's here right now. It's going to go. It has to change. It can't not change. And so when it's pleasant and we remember that it's impermanent, that can sometimes inspire us to be present to it. I was washing some dishes earlier today. And when I, when I picked up the soap, squeezed some soap out and then turned it up right and put it down again, and all these bubbles came like 20 little tiny bubbles. And they're so pretty. I love when that happens. I, it doesn't always happen. Well, when it does, I get excited. I can feel that little girl and I get excited. And so today, as I often practice to do, it doesn't always happen, I stopped and I watched the little bubbles. And of course, there was one that lasted longer than the rest of them. And I just stayed with it. I didn't try to chase after it or pop it or catch it. I just watched this little tiny bubble until I, until I don't know what happened to it. I don't know if it like touched the wall or went all the way down, but I couldn't see it anymore. And I stood there at the sink and I felt, oh, that was pleasant, right? That was nourishing, that very, very simple activity. Yeah, the bells are about to chime next door. So let's listen to the bells and I'll, I'll probably talk a little bit more. Just hearing the bells, 
feeling how your body responds to them. what's going on in the heart, in the mind? Is there any kind of aversion that's present? Or any grasping? Can you notice it? Right, if you're online or you're listening later, you didn't hear any bells. <laughs> so you get to practice with that, like what, huh? Right? They don't come through. And if you're here in the space, like, just to be with that. So I, I can't stress enough that the aversion or the grasping is not a problem. It's a natural response. And our practice can allow us to know it to recognize, to be with the aversion, the grasping, and the being with, that's the magic. I used to hear people say, like, there's an alchemical response or an alchemy. Like, I don't know what that means, alchemy. So I try not to use that word because I don't really know what it means, but I've come to use that word sometimes. And for me, what I'm pointing to, or what I imagine others are pointing to when they say that, is there's a transformation that occurs. There's a change that happens that you don't do. You didn't do it. You were with it. And because you were with it, because you brought mindfulness to it, because you showed up, some magic happens. And that's the practice. I mean, lots of things could be called the practice, but that's a piece of practice is being with whatever. And so sometimes when we're having a strong experience of physical pain or heartbreak or righteous anger, it's really hard to be with that. So I find I can be with my response to that, my wanting to push that away. It's like, oh, there's resistance. I can be with the resistance. And that resistance too, that's impermanent. That's impermanent, always changing. Hmm. So taking this opportunity to find your posture. Right? Maybe you're seated or standing or lying down in a way that, that works for you. Or maybe you wanna make some adjustments or modifications. Take care of yourself. Ask in, listen in, discern and act. If anyone lies down, I will be so excited. <laughs> then I fall asleep. Well, then maybe not for you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Lying down is my formal posture. It's been my formal posture for five or six years now. Yeah, so if you want to try lying down, yeah. Yeah. 
Allison, do you often lie down? No, I don't. Okay, so look look at me for a minute, and I'm gonna do it so that the camera can see too. So you can ignore my lower body. So imagine your lower body is extended. Oh, and your head is supported. Okay, so you're lying down nice and comfy, and even like actually having the table or chair here can be really nice for the low back. So you're lying down. And then both arms like this can be super helpful for wakefulness, for um, an object of awareness or focus of attention. So I'm gonna help you rest, 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 rest into now. And so if we start to get uptight or rigid or stiff or over efforting, right? Over efforting is a thing that happens. The hands kind of do this in some subtler or not so subtle way. And then we start to get spacey, they do this. And so we can just track the hands as an object of awareness to support presence. So that's what we're cultivating here is presence, mindfulness, embodied awareness. And then when you fall asleep, the arm does this. <laughs> and you notice. <laughs> and then so you can lift the arm again gently with awareness and come back to some easeful posture that feels supportive for presence. Because that's what we're practicing to cultivate is presence. We're not practicing, in my book anyway, we're not practicing to cultivate samadhi. We're not practicing to cultivate concentration or equanimity or compassion or metta, at least not in this particular practice, but those things arise from practice. So what I think the doing, if there's any doing, is letting go, is resting and to cultivate some kind of relaxed alertness. And so the body, the body is always with us. You don't get to leave your body really, you know, if you wanna be here for this life, you wanna be here in your body. And so if we're wanting to cultivate a restful alertness in our hearts and our minds, we can start by trying to cultivate with that with our bodies. And so taking time to find the posture of support is helpful. It's very helpful. So relaxed and alert and taking time to find that. And it's not gonna be that posture today is not gonna be the posture from yesterday or tomorrow or in an hour or an hour ago. It's like, okay, right now, can we check in and find, find the posture that's supportive? If you're in a chair, it's really helpful to have the hips up above the knees or on a cushion, same thing. And then some people like support behind their back. Whatever works for you, but long and strong through the back, whether you're lying down or standing or seated, walking long and strong through the back, crown of the head lifting up toward the sky, shoulders broadening out, hips rooting down, knees rooting down, feet rooting down. And if you're standing, then really more specifically, feet rooting down. And if you're lying down, you can feel the whole back body rooting down, being held. And if you're lying down with legs extended, I find it's really nice to have the feet a little bit broader than shoulder width apart and then turned out. And that releases, I find that releases strain on the low back. So settling into your posture. And then because we've taken the time to find a posture that's supportive, it might be easier to find stillness. Or again, this body-mind connection, as we allow the body to find stillness, it creates a condition to support the mind in finding stillness or in settling, right? So the body settles and supports the mind to settle. And the mind will do whatever it needs to do. And we're not going to try to make it do anything. Rooting down, lifting up, broadening out. Coming home to ourselves. Coming home to this ever-changing moment, moment by moment. and allowing the sound of the bell to support us in this homecoming.
There will be a little wake up sound and then three full sounds of the bell. That little wake up sound is for you and for the bell. So let you and the bell know that it's going to be invited to sound. Listen, listen. The sound of this bell brings me back to my true home. Noticing what's present in the field of awareness. Perhaps a thought arises in the mind. What is she talking about? You can be aware of that. Noticing how confusion feels in the body right now. What are you aware of? How are you with that? Do you notice some aversion or some clinging and craving? How's the body? Is it relaxed and alert? Oh, and then what are you aware of now? For an instant, perhaps, we were all aware of the same thing. Observing how the body is responding to the arising and passing experiences. Rising and passing thoughts and emotions. When we notice them, that's mindfulness. That's what we're cultivating.
each time we become aware doesn't matter what we're becoming aware of. We're practicing to become aware, more awake, more alert, more present. What are you aware of now? Some change in the heart, the mind, the body. Can you be with it? Can you be with your experience, your ever-changing experience, just as it is? Can you be with yourself just as you are? Can you get more curious, more interested? Not in the story, but in the felt experience in the body. Rounding down, lifting up, broadening out, engaging with this body. Coming to know it. Learning to listen 
cultivating our ability to listen to ourselves, to our hearts. Not believing the stories, but recognizing them and noticing how the body responds. Being with the body. And if you're becoming aware that a more focused attention would be supportive, bringing attention in to the body in the low belly core and inviting attention to rest there. Or if this broader focus is supporting you and you are dropping into your body as a whole, great, enjoy that. One's no better than the other. So many ways to practice. But I practice to share my practice with you. And I've been quite supported by this broader awareness. Noticing how the body responds. The myriad experiences. They're all coming and going. They're all impermanent. How is the body navigating them? What's the heart doing? What about the gut, the thighs? Can you be with that? Can you be with your experience just as it is? Learning to befriend yourself. Whatever the conditions. Oh, it's like this. Settling into the body. Befriending the body as an act of love. Radical act of love and care. This kind attention.
everything, anything can be held with awareness. Reading ourselves, reading this moment just as it is, perhaps there's a thought or a judgment, some kind of confusion or curiosity, some aversion or grasping, okay. Can you be with it? Can you be here with yourself? With whatever might be arising or passing internally and externally. What if you didn't have to do anything? Nothing to fix, no problems to solve. You get to just be. It's amazing, this gift we can give ourselves. Well, it's not a complacence. It's a learning to sit in the fire and get cooked, be transformed, grow. And from that sitting and being with, hmm, clear seeing happens, wisdom arises, discernment, oh, Ah, yeah. But we can't make that happen. Our only action is to stop and rest and be. Resting into the body.
Of course, thoughts and emotions will continue to arise and pass. Just like sounds and bodily sensations. It's no problem, it's not wrong or bad or good or right. We practice to notice and befriend ourselves. Got you. I'm here for you. Coming back to the body. Noticing how the body is. And allowing it to be. Freedom from fighting. Being with the body.
kindly, gently, with love, befriending our direct experience. It's like this. Coming home to yourself. Receiving the sound of the bell. Noticing how the heart, mind, and body respond. Keeping the eyes closed, if they're closed, or if they were closed for practice, and gradually bringing in movement, really feeling the body move as much as you're able to, letting the heart guide the movement. Practicing to hear that internal wisdom of what this body might need right now. And then feel it, do it, feel it, be with it. And then as you're ready, bringing in light, whatever level of sight you have, 
and taking in the space that you're in, noticing what you notice. Taking note of colors or shapes, linear or nonlinear experiences. And if you can notice what's happening in the body as you do that, as you begin to broaden the field of awareness. Noticing aversion or craving. Any thoughts or judgments, perceptions that might arise? Can you track it? Can you notice? Can you be with it? I feel like I talked a lot before we settled into practice, so maybe I won't talk a lot now, but I do want to say a couple of things. One is that there's no right way to practice, right? Kind of like what I started with, sometimes I'll sound directed, but it's not my intention. There's no right way to practice. There's no wrong way to practice. If you're practicing, that's great. You know, and it'll, it'll, keep, it'll keep flowing and changing and you'll see. Maybe that's all I need to say right now. It's kind of cool. Yeah. I'd love to hear to hear from you. If there's, if there's some voices we haven't heard in the space, that would be great. Um, how was that? Was there something that was pleasant or unpleasant about your practice this evening or something that landed or whether there's resonance or dissonance? Or is there a question about practice? You know, in my fantasy, I would pass a mic around and everyone would get to share. And we don't have time for that in this space. You know, an hour and a half goes by like this for me. So the mic is there. As you're inspired, you can come and grab it. And can you be with yourself in this too? Right? What happens as I have said the little bit that I've said? Thoughts, emotions, what's the body doing? Can you be with it? One of the one of the reasons I enjoy practicing this, like being with whatever is here, is that we can do that whatever we're doing. Right? It's like not just about this period of stillness or formal walking meditation. It's to be present and alive in our lives, to show up for ourselves as we are in each unfolding moment. So that our life is our practice, not just this thing we, we do when we come to the Dharma Collective or, you know, on the, the other extreme, like for an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening. It's not just that. It's all the time, everywhere. Everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> Did anyone not see that movie yet? I totally recommend it. <laughs> totally recommend it. I got the, well, I'm not going to talk about that anymore. 